In the study of speech perception, there are actually a lot of interesting topics that we'll begin to talk about in this video. The goal for this unit of class is to understand some of these things that we have listed on the screen here, starting with the auditory hierarchy, which is just a quick little topic, and then we'll review some of the major problems in the science of speech perception, notably the segmentation problem, the lack of invariance problem, and categorical perception. We'll start with the auditory hierarchy. At the bottom of this is just detection of a sound. You're aware that there's a sound there, but this doesn't necessarily mean that you know that it's different from any other sound or that you know what the sound is. Right above that is discrimination. This means that if you hear two sounds, you know that they're different. And as we have these shapes on the screen here, you might not have a label for what these shapes are, but you can see that they're different. And that's what discrimination means. Right above that is when you actually have a label for that sound. So if you hear a b sound and you know that's a B sound, that will be an example of categorizing it or identifying it. Above that is comprehension. This is where you hear something and you actually know what the information is that's being conveyed. So with this auditory hierarchy, this provides us with some useful terms that we can use as we're describing how research is done or the different things that one can do with your ears and your brain as you're hearing different sounds. There are a lot of major problems in the science of speech perception, and we'll only go over a few here because they're pretty well known and pretty interesting. The segmentation problem is where we convert something that's continuous into something discrete. The lack of invariance problem we'll discuss after that. It looks like an interesting and maybe unusual way of phrasing something because it looks like it's a double negative, but there's a good reason why it's a double negative. Normalization is the solution to that problem, or at least what we think should be the solution. And all these things together will help to explain why humans perform a lot better than machines when recognizing speech. So let's think about segmentation. Again, the idea is that we take a smooth, continuously changing input, and we can convert it into a series of discrete segments. So for example, if we think about the waveform for dog, we know that ultimately we can break this down into a d, a, and g, but how do we do that from the acoustics? As it turns out, the acoustics are pretty difficult to define. So let's think about zooming into the spectrogram of dog. If we look at some of the spectral and temporal features here, we can see that the formant transition that defines this as being a duh has a very specific shape of where the formant frequencies go. And we know that that's an essential part of how we know that this sound begins with a duh. But if this were in a whole phrase saying the dog, we can also look backwards in time and see that the formant frequencies of the also have a particular shape. And this doesn't seem like an intuitive place to look for a cue for the word dog, because after all, it's the word before it. But if we look at another phrase here, the ball, we can see that the formant frequencies in the look different when coming before a B than they looked coming before a D. So it looks like the cues for the D sound and the B sound happen even before the word begins. So this brings us back to the problem of where are the cues for the D sound? Originally, we might have thought they're here during the silent gap and then that burst right at the beginning of the D. But then we learned that there are cues that extend into the vowel, including the formant transitions, and also cues that extend backwards in time to the previous word. So we, of course, would think of the word the as being, you know, backwards in time compared to the word dog, but as it turns out, the same moment in time contains cues for both the word the and the word dog at the same time. And if we look at the end of this square here, we can see that these formant transitions are definitely part of the vowel, but they give us cues about the consonant that just happened. So our conclusion here is that the phoneme acoustics for D spread across time, both backwards and forwards. Another way of saying this is that there's no discrete point in time where one phoneme ends and the next phoneme begins, because they kind of blend across time. An analogy we can make is with visual processing. How do we know what we're looking at here? If we zoom into this little step here, we can see that there are a lot of lines that we can detect that separate the different segments of concrete there, but we know that it's one continuous step. We can also see this line here indicating the shadow, but we know that that's not a separate object. So we have some cues for things that are not really cues for distinctions, and yet we know how to tell the differences of where objects begin and end.
we can look up in the trees and see that we basically have just a smudge of a lot of green, but we know intuitively that there are a lot of different objects in there. So this is really an analogy for the segmentation problem. If we tried to tell a computer, here's how to detect the differences between where one object ends and the other object begins, that would be a very challenging problem, and yet that's what our ears do with sounds all the time. So the segmentation problem, if we were to describe it, is that we hear a series of discrete words, even though there aren't actually any discernible, measurable breaks in the signal. And the problem of this is not that it's difficult, the problem is that we don't know how we do it. So for example, if we look at this waveform here, and I asked you to guess at where the word boundaries would be, you might guess at boundaries like this. After all, these are distinct points in the signal that look like they're very different from their neighboring points. And you might even make finer distinctions at the blocks in the middle, because they have two bumps there, you might even draw a boundary in between those. But all of these boundaries would be wrong. In fact, these are the boundaries between the words. The sentence is, football is a dangerous sport. And as we can see, this big apparent break right here is just a stopgap in the middle of one word. And this line right here is going through one S sound, but because this word ends in S and this word begins in S, there's just one S. And we just have to know intuitively that there's a word boundary in the middle of it. In the word dangerous, we have lots of different syllables here and we just have to know that it all groups together as one word. So this is a pretty challenging problem, because there are no set rules for where the boundaries occur. You just have to know how the language works. And we know this intuitively if we just look at text. So if I remove all the spaces from these sentences, you can recognize the ones for the languages that you speak. In English, of course, this would say, I love teaching this class. And in Finnish, rakastan oppiatata luokka, you would know that if you spoke Finnish, but if I didn't put any of the spaces in there, it would be very challenging to know where the spaces would go. And this is the same for any language. As you speak it, there aren't any spaces that we put in the sounds. We put the spaces in the writing because we sort of know that there should be spaces between discrete words, but when we speak them aloud, there aren't any such spaces. And that's the problem, is that we have to figure out how to do that and we do it so effortlessly, and yet there's not really a way that we can explain how we do it. Another major problem in the study of speech perception is variance. So I'll begin with an analogy. We look at all these different typefaces, or fonts, and we know intuitively that they all say the same thing, and yet they all look so different if we were trying to describe them, right? So this one has all these little curly cues in it, and we wouldn't necessarily define them as an essential part of the letter. We can see this A as having a pretty rounded shape, this one is very angular, and the one up top has like a little hat on top of the A, and yet we recognize these all as the same letter. Over in the right column, there's one of them that's blue, but we wouldn't say that that means it is saying something different. Over here near the bottom, we have widely spaced letters, and these are squished letters but we, again, say that they're the same letters. So we have a lot of variance, and if you were to describe to someone what it is that is the shape of the letter A or B or C or so on, this would demonstrate that that's a pretty difficult thing to do, because as soon as you start defining what it is that is the shape of a letter, you can find some example that violates that description, and yet you still know that it's the same letter. So this brings us to what we call the lack of invariance problem. The problem is that there's no simple mapping of phonemes to corresponding acoustic units or waveforms. Then this is because everyone speaks differently, and depending on the environment you're in, the specific room, if you're talking on a phone or in a hallway, there's lots of different contributors to the acoustic structure and different things that will change it. And so, as speech scientists, we can look for what we call invariant cues, cues that are always there, regardless of what room you're speaking in, regardless of who's talking, and we should be able to account for all those differences. But unfortunately, there are no invariant cues. So this would make it seem like speech perception should be a very difficult process, and yet it seems very easy and accessible 
even if we're listening to a talker that we've never heard before. And so this is the phrasing of the problem. We don't know how it's possible how we do this. Nobody really knows. The problem is that the lack of invariance problem is not a problem. Here are some examples of variance. There are differences in voice pitch and formant frequencies across people with different gender, and also across different talkers who have the same gender. C. 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 These are all the same word, but the acoustic structure coming from all these different talkers is quite different. Vowels have different duration depending on the phonetic environment that they're in. So in this case, we have the word mob and mop, and we can see that the vowel in mob is quite a bit longer than the vowel in mop, but we can think of these as being essentially the same vowel. Consonants also sound differently depending on the phonetic environment. So here we have the words seek, soon, s seek and soon both start with an s sound, but the acoustics are quite different because seek has a lip position where the lips are retracted, but soon has a lip position where the lips are protruded. And here's a close up inspection of that sound. So you can probably tell the difference between those two sounds, but you would still call both of them S. Here's an example of variance in the signal that doesn't really get in the way of us knowing what sound it is that we heard. Speech sounds different depending on the room you're in. So if you're speaking in a little tiny echoic room like a laundry room, it might sound like this. Seek. But if you're speaking in a really large cathedral, it might sound um, with longer reflections like this. Seek. So these are pretty extreme examples, but you can imagine that we're very sensitive to different acoustic differences, and depending on the room we're in, the acoustics will change quite a bit. Another more simple example is that different talkers just have different acoustic properties. So for example, the sentence, The candy shop was empty. Or this sentence, The candy shop was empty. We recognize these as being the same sentence, but there's actually a lot of acoustic difference there. The first one had all different frequencies and all different durations. So if there are no consistent frequencies or durations, what else is there to compare these sounds and know that they actually are the same sentence? This is a mystery. How do we solve the lack of invariance problem? The problem is we know that we do solve it because you can understand the speech that I'm saying and probably understood all the speech I played on the previous slide. But the problem is we don't know how we solve all this. We don't know how we can cut through all that variance and still understand what we're hearing. The term for how we do this is normalization, calibrating to an individual talker to know what speech sounds are being heard. So it's not as simple as just tuning a radio because there's more than just one frequency we need to tune into. But let's make an example using a vowel chart here. We have vowel spaces plotted here for adults, women and men, and kids, girls and boys. So suppose we just take this intersection of frequencies here, this F1 and F2 intersection. This could either be an A spoken by a woman or an I spoken by a boy because they both have the same acoustic properties. And over here, this could either be an O spoken by a man or an uh spoken by a boy. How do we know which one it is? Well, the idea is that we could, by listening to the talker, get a sense of where that talker's vowel space is. And within this green space, this acoustic intersection, this set of formant frequencies looks like it's a little bit lower in that space, so it's probably more like an uh, but within the gray vowel space, it's a little bit higher, and therefore more like an O. Oh. And that might help us tell exactly what sound it is that we're hearing. The same thing can be done for the first set of vowels, even though it's a little bit more tricky to see on this particular slide. A lot of people have come up with mathematical formulas to try to figure out how we can convert acoustic values into normalized values. That way we can cut through some of that variance and really know what's being said even though there's a lot of variability in the signal. We won't go through all these formulas, but you can tell that there's a lot of interesting and technical mathematics that goes into this. But in the end, normalization still remains a mystery. How do we do it? 
I don't have the answers. <laughs>